Thank you, good afternoon. Well, how many of you have seen fake news during the last year? I want to see some hands. Oh, lots of hands, almost everybody. Well, it's many of us. Because of Europeans, 42% trust in me, only the 42% of Europeans trust in media news. And only 33% of Europeans trust in news they find they find on the internet. And even less, 23% trust in news they receive via so social media. In Spain, only 55% of us are confident on our ability to spot and detect fake news. And there's another study that said that in 2022, most Western countries will consume more fake news than real news. It's a Gartner study. Fake news uh, usually gets spread in times of political elections. We have recently the example of the Bolsonaro, the Bolsonaro campaign in Brazil. Brazil is one of the uh, countries with more users of WhatsApp. They have 120 million users in WhatsApp. And the fallout of Sao Paulo made a study in that election where they saw that 97% of the news that were uh, shared via WhatsApp in Bolsonaro supporters groups were fake, 97%. In neutral, we are more than 70 people working in a startup. We work in the city center of Madrid. We are fact checkers, we are journalists, and we, all, we are also developers and uh, designers and product people and documentalists and video makers. And we are all obsessed with one thing, to use to see how we can use better the technology and the journalists to, to make citizenship better informed. Uh, we started, uh, the team that makes uh, the fact-checking started in 2013 doing the Ob El Objetivo, the Ana Pastor program in TV, and they were the first journalists that brought the fact-checking journalism to TV and they did it in prime time. So we are, have an experience of six years now. Um, Ana Pastor in, Enero, in January, sorry, in January 2018 uh, created, created her own startup to be able to not only uh, share and distribute this kind of content in TV, but also to, to do it in other platforms, as via web, as other social networks. For us, information is a big thing because if you have good information, you can make better decisions. But also, the free, the independent, and also a pluralistic media is one of the fundamental elements of a democracy. But the impact that fake news have right, right now is very important, and they have a real effect. They can even cause deaths. We have some examples. There were, last year, there were some lynchings in India more than at least, they say some, some people say 27, but at least 20 people were dead in lynchings uh, that happened after some information, some fake information was spread via WhatsApp. India is the first country in, in WhatsApp users uh, number. It's the, they have 230 million. Um, Fake news have, have also impact on science and on what we know about vaccination, for instance. 48% of Europeans think that vaccines can have severe side effects and also 38% of them can think they can cause illnesses. And also 31% of them, a third, are sure that they can weaken the immune system. Also, the European Commission and the World Health Organization they blame the rise of the anti-vaccine movement to some disinformation campaigns that are spread via social media. Fake news also have, uh, have a very strong impact in disasters like hurricanes and these kind of situations. We know that so online social media plays a vital role during real-time events, crises. There's a, stu a study of Twitter during the Hurricane Sandy in, tw in 2012 in the year 2012, they analyzed the fake images they were, that were spread through Twitter during the disaster, and they saw that 10,350 were unique tweets containing fake images. 
and 86% of the tweets were, uh, that were spreading fakes were retweets. As you can see, there were few uh, original tweets. Fake news also have a very great impact on climate change information. Most of YouTube videos are related to, uh, to, to, content, to content that oppose the scientific consensus on climate change. 200, there's a study also from Germany, from the Aachen University in Germany, that says that 200 videos on, on YouTube were analyzed. They, had, uh, they were all, all of them related to climate change. And most of them, 107 of them, denied it was caused by human, human action. And also, we saw in the study that conspiracy theories, the, the conspiracy theories context, received the most uh, number of, of engagement, more views, more comments, and more reactions. And also, uh, fake news, as you know, has an impact on elections, on political elections. Um, there are many, many social media studies on the effect of, pop of, of social media uh, campaigns in populist voting. And we have on all, only these uh, numbers here, that 126 million Americans were shown political-oriented uh, fake news stories via Facebook, and 20 of the most popular fake studies received more engagements than the real uh, news. So in this kind of scenario, how do we work in a, in a newsroom? It's a very difficult situation in a, in a newsroom, because for, in one side we have this low trust of the public in media, in general media, and there's also another explosion of disinformation. A lot of disinformation and fake news that arrives everywhere in, in different uh, channels, social media, even um, WhatsApp and, and private messages. And there's also, this is um, a, a big part of the problem because what we call dark social channels are the channels that are not easy to see for us because they are private, they are encrypted, they, the, the fake news go circulate via WhatsApp, so we as a journalist cannot see them, cannot see what is being said there. And so we have this situation in a newsroom where fact checkers are really overloaded with work, we, we are always busy with work, and also we have a human situation between, uh, a human situation in which when somebody receives lots of contradictory information between A and B, we usually tend to trust the, the one that is more emotional for us, the one we want to believe. So, the first obvious way of solving this problem, of having our fat checkers overloaded, is basically having more fat checkers. Or we can also try to get more journalists, you know, that kind of journalists that they need to be super fast doing things, they need to be trustworthy, they need to be the best in their class, and they need to be committed to help others. Are there this kind of journalists in the world? Yes, they are. But the problem is that this journalist is working in the Daily Planet and not in neutral, okay? So we decided to do a different kind of hiring, and we prefer to hiring this kind of fact checker. We do believe that fact checking can be solved, the problem of fake news in fact checking, of automated fact checking, can be solved by artificial intelligence. But always with human intervention. Because fact checking is a very complex problem where human judgment is always needed. It's not so easy to decide if something is truth or is fake, because there are a lot of political contexts that you need to know. So our main goal is to combine human intelligence with artificial intelligence in a way that uh, we are building some kind of human-in-the-loop system where uh, the bots are able to help journalists to enhance their capacity through AI. When we are speaking about fake news, normally we're thinking this is a technological issue. But it's a technological issue, but it's going far beyond that. A recent study has shown us that false news was 70% more likely to be retweeted than the truth. And this was not because of automated bots. It was because of humans retweeting. 
And why this is happening? Because we do love gossip. We do love sharing things that have an impact in others. We do love sharing things that are aligned with our own beliefs, although we know that they are false. So we are facing a human nature problem. It's in our own uh, psyche. So when you think about uh, Russian bots, please think that the most advanced Russian bot normally is us. Think when you are retweeting something. And the problem is that the truth is spread in a slower way than the lie. So we have a communication problem. How can we make that the truth is spread in a better way? We don't know, but journalists are specialists in communication. That's why we believe that the proper way to solve this problem is to mixture journalism with technology. And the fake news fighting ground is large, and good players and bad players are using both technology. Spoiler alert, bad players are winning the race <laughs> up to now. For instance, one of the sexiest topics now that is the deep fakes, probably most of you have seen this amazing deep fake about the E team, not the A team, the E team with our politicians, okay? We have amazing technology for building this kind of deep fakes. And the technology to detect them is still being developed. Facebook has launched a $10 million contest to create the no new novel techniques to detect deep fakes. They are hiding actors to create data sets of deep fakes because we don't have them. And then they are going to release those data sets so we can create this kind of new technology. There are many other fighting grounds, shallow fakes, ad fraud detection, fake news detection, but in this presentation, we are going to focus on automated fact checking. That is the kind of automated system that Neutral is building. For a long time, technology has been used for spread misinformation. Now we are trying to use technology as a shield in such a way that we are able to massively scale uh, fact checking using computers. And even if we are able to create this technology, the challenge is huge. Donald Trump has made 13,435 false or misleading claims for almost 1,000 days. And I'm not saying this, it's the Washington Post who is saying this. Do the maths, guys, do the maths. 13 false claims per day. This guy is a machine, okay? He has to start lying in the morning when he's having breakfast. I don't know how he's able to do that, but he's, he's really good at doing that. And this is new politics. And fact checkers have to work in this new scenario. So how's done the fact checking process in a newsroom? We start with the first step, which is monitoring, I mean, listening to all the politicians. And I mean exactly this. We, at the moment, we are 14 fact checkers who every morning, every day, starts listening to uh, all the discourse, the public discourse of, the, of our politicians, the, the main candidates of the, of the main parties in Spain. They do it, they, they, they share, they, they organize themselves in, in a team. So everybody uh, hears. And it's two kinds of, of, proce of processes we have. I mean, for a Every day, all the days, we do this, the active listening, and we take all the, the declarations they have. And then we also do the live fact-checking, which means that sometimes there's an, an important debate on television or in, in a political election or something like this. We do the live fact-checking, and everybody is listening, trying to get what they say, and trying to verify it very quickly, and posting the results on the internet. This is a teamwork. We cannot do it, it by alone. So they are all together in a teamwork, and they, uh, they are communicating themselves on the moment they are, they are working. And it's not only to listen to, the, to it, but they have to be doing, at the same time, a selection of the claims that they have to verify. Well, how can we automate the monitoring? Well, in the last year, there has been great advance in deep learning models that have made the speech-to-text technology accurate enough to be a mainstream in technology. So we 
can remove active listening by making a machine to listen to the politicians. And probably journalists are happy because of that, okay? It's, it's a cumbersome task. So what are we doing? We are um, connecting our video server to live video streams or to simply we upload videos to them. We order to a cloud server uh, speech-to-text service like our AWS Transcribe or Google or Amazon or Spismatics, that is the, the one that we are using right now. We order for the transcripts, and the transcripts are storing our data lake. Then our journalists are able to read the transcript instead of having to listen to it. Reading is much quicker than listening. So we are able to save up to 30% of fat checkers' time only by integrating speech recognition in our current workflow. But the world is not always perfect, and there are a lot of challenges that we need to solve in order to make this a production tool or a productivity tool. First challenge is that um, all those a speaker, a speech to test technology is good in English, is not so good in Spanish. And specifically, when we are talking about pronunciation, the output is really bad. Uh, sorry, punctuation, not pronunciation. So, as fact checkers, we need to have complete sentences because we provide a rating for each sentence. If the transcript mechanism is not able to give us complete sentences, the system is not going to work. This is one of the biggest issues we have now. We are trying to uh, find out a solution uh, by using sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, but our first uh, results on, on these experiments are not good enough. Second challenge. Speech-to-text technologies are, half, are accurate enough for, uh, for making us to understand uh, the transcript but they are not 100% perfect. And this is very dangerous for us, because if in one claim we transcribe only one figure in a wrong way, we have a problem. So each time, journalists need to review all claims that at the end we want to fact check. And finally, also, it's very important not what is being said, but also who is saying it. So we need good speaker identification systems, and probably, if you have seen some kind of uh, political debate, you will understand that it's very difficult to uh, figure out who, who one is speaking when they are interrupting each other. Well, the second part of the process is the claim detection. When they are listening, they have to select the statements that are to be verified. We, you know, um, we are part of the International Fact Checking Network, that means we have to follow a methodology, and it's a very strict methodology because we get certified every year. And this means that uh, manually, each journalist has to um, select that verifiable claim. Not everything is verifiable. This is important because only facts are verifiable. Not every data is verifiable, only some kind of data we can verify. And also opinions are not verifiable. Sometimes people ask us, somebody said something, and I want to, you to verify it. And if that's an, opi an opinion, we cannot really do that. Um, in, this, in this part of, of this, the, the process, we have to do it manually, because every, every journalist has, has to be listening and selecting those pieces of information that, has, that have to be verified. OK, this is where the magic really is automated claim detection. Can we eliminate the human in this process? We can do it, and currently we have a system that is able to do that with a, a good performance. I will try to explain you how this is working right now. We have a machine that is reading the transcripts and without human intervention, select factual statements, sentences that have facts inside of it and automatically send this information to our workflow tool. Basically, this is something like a Jira, but uh, for journalists, okay? If we are able to integrate this claim detection with uh, a good speech recognition technology, we will be able to save up to 80% of the time of our fact checkers. This 
in, according to our estimates, it will be to speed up our operation at least in 10 times. How are we doing this? Or how are we able to create this claim detection algorithm? Basically, it's based in three main modules. First of all, a language model. This is uh, a model trained by Google with Google News data that basically allows us, it's a neural net, allows us to capture the meaning of the sentences, such a way that we can provide to the classifier some signals about uh, all sentences that are talking about unemployment or sentences that talk about uh, gross domestic product or whatever, normally have a high probability of being a factual statement. The second module is uh, a module that works with the language structure. Here, we are working with NLP libraries in order to first extract entities, persons, organizations, date, currencies, etc. because normally when these kind of entities appear in a sentence, there are facts in it. And also we are extracting syntactic and grammatical structure, trying to figure out which are the most common compositions that are part of factual statements. This is also new signals that we are going to fit with them to the classifier. And finally, we also uh, input the system with ad hoc no uh, knowledge from experts. We input language pattern. For instance, we know that factual statements have to be declared with uh, verbs in past or present tense. We know that normally uh, there are comparisons, uh, comparisons in factual statements. We know that temporal adverbs should be there. We know that there are some kind of words, a lexicon, that are ambiguous by nature. And however, there are other kinds of words that are more concrete and they are more prone to be in factual statements. So we combine all of this, we put all these kind of signals to a binary classifier, and the classifier is going to tell us if this is a factual statement or it's not. Uh, for training the classifier, the classifier, we have tested or trained or tried uh, support vector machines, naive budgets models, and logistic regressions. And uh, of course, this is a supervised uh, learning approach. This is how or what the fact checker watches at the end. It's simply an editor with a transcript, and all the sentences that contain factual statement are highlighted by the machine. Imagine that you have to read 2,000 sentences and trying to figure out in which of them there are facts. And now, imagine that pressing a button in one second, you have this. Okay. The improvement is really big for them. But also, in the real world, there are a lot of challenges, issues that we need to solve. First of all, noisy transcripts. We talked about it before. We have a good accuracy with perfect transcripts. But when the transcript is noisy, because the speech to text is not good enough, our current classifier is not uh, resistant enough. The accuracy goes down. Second challenge, multi-language. If we want to identify claims in English, we cannot use this approach because our model is for Spanish, the language patterns are thought for Spanish language, so we cannot extend and adapt. We need to figure out how we can make a multi-language model. And the most important one, we need more data, as in any kind of machine learning approach. And we would like to try, for instance, with neural nets, but we don't have enough data to do that. What is our training data set, or in which way have we have this da data set been built? Well, it's a little bit cumbersome, but uh, at least three journalists, three different journalists, have been reviewed the congressional records, okay? And they have been labeled uh, all the sentences on those records in four different categories. Factual statement with high confidence, factual statement, low confidence, um, undefined and unfactual statement. Three different fact checkers need to label each one of the sentences, and then we have a fourth fact checker, uh, because even with the experts, there are disagreements sometimes about if this is a factual statement or not. It's not so easy. Only it's more or less it's easy when it's uh, the first category. Factual statement, high confidence. But with the low confidence, we are in the borderline. So we have a fourth uh, fact checker that adds uh, the, or plays the role of a judge and make decisions on disagreements. And think about it. What do you think that is the average percentage of factual statements 
in Congress transcripts. More than 50, for sure not. They are our politicians, okay? Uh, more than 30, we don't know. Less than five, our data, or at least our average, is that between 10 and 50% of what they are saying is a factual statement. But depending on the topic, when they are talk talking about things like Catalonia or, or they are in a censorship motion of a politicians, as they are trying to inflame emotions and passion, the language changes. And only 5% of the statements are factual. We are not using data in order to defend that kind of positions. I was explaining to you that we can speed up the process, but also we can increase our coverage. Marilyn didn't say anything about monitoring Twitter social networks. We are not doing it manually, but now with our bot and with our claim detection algorithm, we can do it. We are monitoring 25 political accounts. The bot is reading their tweets and is trying to figure out if there are some factual statements in those tweets. If there are something there, we send that information directly to our head of fact-checking. And for, them, um, for him, it's the same that if any other journalists are sending him something to review. So we have a person, in this kind, it's a bot, that is 24-7 working on monitoring politicians. In case of WhatsApp, we cannot do it because WhatsApp is not providing us with any kind of API to work with them. So we have a lot of people that send us statements to be verified or photos or whatever, and this is a manual process, and at the end, our newsroom is overloaded by their request. Well, step three is how we check data. data. Um, we follow the methodology, as said before, and we have some rules we have to follow. One of them is that we only use some only use official sources data to, to check the, the verifications. Another rule is that we have to have three people on, from the team validating the same process. After one, after a journalist does it, then it, it gives all the investigation to another one and it repeats the process to see that everything is correct and the, the steps have been followed. And we are always asking the source. I mean, if a politician said something and we want to verify it, we always ask that politician or that party to see what they say. Some, some people doesn't uh, know this, but we always do that as a rule. And in this case, this step has to be done by a human because it's a human who can call the party. It's a human who has the, the phone number and has to call and has to talk to him and has to explain what we are doing. We are journalists, we want to verify this and, and so on. And also, it has to be a human because only a human can understand the context, the political situation in a, in, in a same con in the same day, in the same context, in, 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 a, in a week even. Because the context can change and words that say something in a, in a week are not the same, they, has, they don't, have, they don't make sense in the next week. Hmm? So this is, uh, this is a step that has to be done by a human. It's very important. Okay, as Marilyn said, this has to be done for a human, so why I'm talking now, okay? I'm talking now because although the human is really important in this stage, we can make some tasks for them to help him in some situations, two main situations. First one, what happens if the claim is already being stored in our fact check database? We could simply retrieve that claim and give it to the person that is asking for it. Okay? In, an, in an ideal world, this will work something like this. Okay? We could use this system with a live transcription and with the claim matching algorithm to make real-time live automated fact checking in a political debate. So if Trump is saying a lie, and that lie has been already stored in our fact check database because politicians repeat the same lies, we can open a pop-up and say, hey, he's lying. This is a mock-up from, from Duke University in the United States. All we are talking about at the end are research projects, okay? But this is the ideal future we would like to, to work for. But what happens in order to do this it's not so easy as to compare this sentence with this sentence, because language are complex. And you can say the same claim in many different ways. So as a first iteration, 
we develop what we close, clo uh, what, what we call closed search, that basically uh, is being implemented with an elastic search engine. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, matching words and giving some fuzziness in the search. But after that, we iterated and created a second version that we call near search. Here we are using word embeddings. Basically, we have trained a system to understand uh, political speeches, and so he, he, this system is able to understand words that are used in the same context, and they are able even to understand claims that are expressed in very different ways, but at the end their meaning is the same. Uh, this second system works better with long sentences. The first system works better with short sentences. So what we are doing? Mixing both systems. Okay. But the problem is not here. The problem is that search needs to be contextual. It's not the, the meaning of the sentence can be totally different if a different person said it, if uh, the person said it in a different moment, if the person said it in a different place. So we still have a long road to, to go if we want to be able to retrieve automatically fact checks from a factual database. What we think that we can do now is always having this journalist reviewing these results, and then he's going to sell it if we can, do, uh, if we can give this, this uh, result or not. The second task where we can help the journalists a lot is retrieving data. This is a basic information retrieval mechanism. In order to evaluate if something is true or not, journalists need to go to official sources, get the data, compare the data, and then they emit, submit a judgment. Okay, what can we do? If we're able to understand the claim with NLU, we can extract the entities, we can try to create a query with these entities, and we can send that query to a knowledge graph. This knowledge graph has to be previously being built by scrapping official sources like the INE or the EROSTAT, and then when we get the data that is needed, we provide a data chart to a journalist. This in the ideal world. Problem. Normally, we don't have structured data. Open data movements are not so good as they should be. And also, if you want to fact check a local politician or a regional politician, this is a nightmare because you should have to integrate with local informational systems and need to understand different standards, regional standards normally. OK, so what we do when we have already the verification made, then we do it, we publish it. We are journalists. So we publish it online on our web, in our web. And then we have this thing that with Google, that Google shows our fact-checking better in the results if, if there's a, a, a verification made by a fact-checker. And then Facebook also, they issue an alert if some people has uh, shared a, a content that we have verified. So they send an alert to the user and they say, hey, this that you, that you shared before has been verified by neutral and the rating is false or true or everything. And also, Facebook uh, changes the algorithm for that kind of content and it shows less to, the, to other users because it not, they know it's, it's false or it's misleading. That's what, what we do. And al of course, we also share all this information on, social, on our social networks. So the verifications also are being spread. Well, now I'm going to talk to you only about one idea, something that we want to explore. We want to know if this is going to work or not. Um, how can we make that the truth spread faster than the, than the lie? We don't know, but we would like to explore if voice power assistants like Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, whatever you want to call them, could be useful in this fight against fake news. Imagine a system when I'm asking Alexa if it's true this thing that I have uh, listening about whatever. And Alexa is asking me new questions when she needs more context in order to answer if this is true or not. This is very similar to the thing that we do normally when we are having lunch with our friends and we are speaking about fake news. We all of us are discussing, we are finding data, and we are asking for more arguments supporting one thing or another. Maybe if we are able enough to create this intelligence inside of these uh, smart speakers, we can have a system that everyone can use. Even my mom is able to listen and to speak with Alexa. 
Sometimes she has some problems with the name, but she is able to speak with, it, uh, with this device. And uh, at the end, we would be able to create a system where it's like we were able to talk directly with the journalists that create the, fa the fact check, because we can go deeper asking Alexa for more details about what this is true or what this is false. Give me more data. Why do you think that? Imagine that scenario. We would like to figure out if we can do this in the next years. Because all of these things that we are talking to you about are, from our perspective, a richer project that is advancing. Uh, it's not only Neutral who is working in this. This is a, a global uh, challenge that we have in the world, trying to make automatic fact-checking a reality. Uh, the stages one or two, we have uh, them most advanced. Uh, stages three and four, we are still working on them. So our requirement here to all of you is that if you are from a research group or a company that is working with these technologies and you think that you can collaborate with us, that you can provide us with something that could help us to improve our systems, please send me an email, this is my address, okay? Even if you are a technical guy, talented, and you like to work against fake news, also send us an email. We have a small team of, uh, of uh, technical guys. We are minority in the newsroom, <laughs> okay? We, we want to be more there. So even if you have an idea, don't hesitate, send us, because we would like to discuss it with you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, and we are open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben and Marilyn. Uh, super interesting um, how it's evolving, the ability to fight back. Questions in the audience there? Uh, I have to cover my eyes. As you can see, we can't see anyone. Any questions? And where do you see, I have a question. Okay. What does it look like in five years time? Does the, are we going through a, a period of, you know, fake news, everyone thinks that what is happening right now will be what it's gonna happen forever. But obviously, as you're seeing, you can fight back. Will it, the tide shift and in five, 10 years, fake news will be a thing of the past? I hope so. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people working in this like us. Uh, developers, also journalists are very, um, concerned about the situation. I, I think we are a lot of people working on it and I want to hope that it changed and even we, we, we get to make a, a public more informed and more mm -hmm. um, sceptic on, on this mm -hmm. kind of, of situation. And, and who checks the fact checkers? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a typical question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, at the end, is uh, the methodology that you are following okay. what uh, ensures that you are doing your work as you should be doing it, mm -hmm. okay? And there are not only one fact checker, there are sure. many fact checkers. So at the end, you can have uh, different opinions about the same fact. Mm -hmm. The problem is really that some political parties, for instance, in UK, they are trying to uh, meddling with fact checkers and mm. they create accounts that they said fact check UK and at the end yeah. it's a political yeah. party. So okay. this is a, a danger. But I believe that fake news is something that we, we are going to, it's going to be part of our lives forever probably because uh, it can only be changed through education. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a long process and technology is going to evolve in one way and the other way. The mm. face are going to be <laughs> something probably in two years. We are going to see <laughs> amazing videos of a lot of people. But um, I don't know if the good guys or the bad guys are going to win. I expect that the good guys, but only if we are with a skepticism mm. and trying to, to, to be more critical, what, what we do in social networks, sure. we can fight this. Perfect. Oh, well, thank you very much. And thank you. A big round of applause because they're fighting the good fight. Thank you, guys.